I appreciate the, I appreciate y'all having me up here, and uh, I'm going to walk around a little bit more. Uh, I don't like this game behind if I don't have to. Um, so, to the point of a dozen projects completed or in progress, because I think we all know, much like ham projects, Raspberry Pi projects can start off as, wow, this would be a great idea. Why don't I build this? Uh, and I'll, I'll point to a uh, perfect one. I have a six-pack switching for my antennas. And I said, well, why don't I build a Pi that will read the LEDs and uh, then display it on another monitor so I can access it remotely. And I went and I wired up the Pi, and it's still sitting on top of the six-pack to be integrated at some point. So great ideas. It inspires a lot of ideas, but they don't all get done. Uh, but thank you for having me out today. So Raspberry Pi, I really want to kind of explain what it is first, and then I'll talk a little bit about what you can do with it uh, in your ham shack. And uh, we're going to end up with two projects that are relatively straightforward to get started on that will hopefully uh, whet your appetite to do more with this uh, little computer and uh, start experimenting and playing. So Raspberry Pi uh, has a couple of different flavors, but it really started off with this guy here. Uh, this is the Raspberry Pi uh, Model A. And the Model A really was a simple, uh, actually this is a Model B, but um, it really was just a simple board with about 40 pins of things you can interface with it, a couple of USB ports, and a Ethernet connection. And they have developed and enhanced it over time as they've been able to keep the price at about $35 for the board, but as the cost of electronics gets cheaper, they've integrated Bluetooth, they've integrated Wi-Fi, uh, they've added some additional ports, and done some other things. But the Pi originally came out in 2012, and really kind of was originally designed by a British group to figure out a way to get kids more interested in uh, computers in Britain. So I think a lot of us here in this room, and judging by some of the similar gray hair that, uh, that I have in the, I'm seeing in the crowd here, a lot of us grew up building our own computers, right? And we knew how to deal with IRQ conflicts or put a new processor in or those kind of things. But kids don't really do that these days. You buy a laptop off the shelf and it's good to go, or you buy an iPad or something. So they really saw the need to get kids more learning about how to develop hardware and software and do some interfacing. So Raspberry Pi Foundation came up with this. The first one was $35, and they've kept it at about that price ever since for the fully loaded big one. And I'll show you the little one here in a second. Um, $85, uh, so $35 for the board. By the time you get a power supply and a SD card, which is your drive, and some other things for the projects, you'll probably be in it about 70, 80 bucks, depending on how cheap you are and how much you want to go for uh, some different things and what you might have lying around the house. Uh, so I'm going to pass this, Nick. I'm going to hand that to you. That's a uh, good job. Uh, you can share that around just to give folks an idea of what, uh, what a pie looks like. There are two current flavors of pie. They're both raspberry, uh, but they have a little bit different uh, different flair uh, and different project capabilities. So the big one, and the one that's going around right now, is the Raspberry Pi 3 Model B. So why it's the Model B is generally because it's got the four USB ports. Uh, it's a 1.2 gigahertz quad-core processor, 64-bit processor, but most of the stuff right now for Pi's runs 32-bit. Uh, it's an ARM8 processor, so it's not the typical Intel-based processor that you, x86-based, uh, but it does have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth low energy in it, so uh, you can do a lot of interfacing of this with just a little, uh, just a little board. And really, if you just put power and uh, a drive on it, you can run whatever you want off of it. Uh, in, the, in the spirit of that, as uh, a couple of years ago, they said, this is all great, but we really, we really want something that, I don't know if you compete with the Arduino, but we wanted something that was a little smaller footprint that can go into lower th uh, smaller things. So out came the Raspberry Pi Zero, and this is the version 1.3 of the Pi Zero. 
the benefit of this little guy is it, it'll go anywhere, right? I, the, I didn't do the pictures for size, but here's a Pi Zero right here. And as you can see, a little tiny guy uh, that can be snuck into a robot or a weather station or those kind of things. So. You um, uh, I will eventually want it back, yes. <laughs> um, 1.2 gigahertz, uh, 1 gigahertz processor, that is the same processor that was in the original uh, Raspberry Pi 1. So the power has moved up over time, but uh, 1 gigahertz processor, these are USB OTG ports, which means they're the little tiny ones that look almost like uh, micro uh, USB ports. Um, and it takes a mini HDMI cable instead of a regular one. So while this kind of takes all the standard off-the-shelf connectors uh, with Ethernet and those kind of things, this takes special connectors. So the $5 price point is deceiving because you've got to, again, buy a few more things to go with it. But the base board is $5. Something new in the Zero world is the kind of the second generation of the Zero, uh, now the Pi Zero W is the brand new uh, the brand new board that just came out last week, so uh, had some conversations about, oh, you got a W, I didn't get a W yet, uh, and they you can buy them at Micro Center and they come in a bag about this size, so it's not really a big thing. These are $10, uh, and for the additional $5 you get over the original uh, 1.3, you've got uh, all this little special USB, or excuse me, Wi-Fi stuff. So they added Bluetooth, low energy, and Wi-Fi to this. I think this really makes this Pi the butter zone for projects that you're gonna wanna work on because you generally don't need the extra 200 megahertz of processor performance. You do need a little bit smaller and a little bit more um, capabilities of integrating stuff. So, especially since I run a lot of my projects headless, I think this is gonna be where a lot of the development goes on. And for 10 bucks, you really can't beat the cost once you got, kind of got invested in the cables and that kind of thing. So, uh, that Pi, that's a, the Zero that's actually going around is the Zero W, uh, if you want to take a look at that. So what can you connect to a Pi? Because it's great to have a little computer, but it's all about what you can do with it, right? So the thing about the Pies is really the fact that you can interface a lot of things to it relatively inexpensively and relatively easily. So uh, there are um, a lot of standards, Linux-based things that you can do uh, if you know Python or C or a lot of the programming languages, you can pretty quickly program something up to run on a Pi. If you don't know those things, you can pretty quickly find on the web, cut and paste, to program and run a Pi. So that's kind of the cool thing to do uh, with that. But let me kind of give you the anatomy of a Pi here real quick. Uh, four USB ports, again, this is the, the, model, uh, the model 3. Uh, 100 base T Ethernet, so plenty of uh, power for in and out there. Uh, it has a 3.5 millimeter port, uh, which is four poles. So you can use this for uh, audio out, or you can use it for, uh, for video out. If you instead want to do other video, it's got standard HDMI. Uh, makes it nice and easy so you can plug it into any monitor in your house. And you got a monitor at home that has two ports maybe, so one of them's on your TV, but you want to flip on and maybe have a little dashboard so you can watch your APRS while you're sitting at home and just flip the input while the wife's in the other room. You plug that other HDMI port in the back, plug that into your into your TV, and you're good to go there. Uh, it all, it's also got a camera port. So this little port here, and uh, similarly on the Pi Zero, uh, there's a camera port. So Pi has come out with a, a group of uh, eight megapixel cameras, uh, and they're used for again for students to develop webcams or to put on robots or to do uh, identification of items that you might see as it drives around, uh, so detection, that kind of thing. You can actually get an infrared camera or a regular camera for that, and it's native right onto the board, so really handy. You don't use up a USB port if you want to get a camera integrated there. Uh, all the power for the Pies is micro USB, so if you've got that adapter for your, uh, for your Android phone, 
goes right in there, same adapter, so you don't have to worry about it. You do have to worry about power. These things do suck up the power a little bit. You want to make sure you don't use the super cheap little square brick that you get with your uh, that you get with your iPhone that looks like a building block. That does not have enough power, and you will get frustrated as hell uh, trying to run this thing and figure out what's going on because you're starving it for power. So get a decent sized iPad or a million different uh, bricks you can use uh, to get charged up for your pipe. Uh, how, what, how many so, amps? Uh, I mean, 2.5 amps. Okay, so you, you need a 3 amp, amp power, power supply. You need a decent power supply. What I find works really well, I run a lot of pies, uh, so I've got an array of six pies that are set up in one area. And what I do is you can buy these uh, chargers for your house, right, where you, you plug in once and it's got six or seven USB ports on it. Uh, Anchor makes the one I use, but there's others you can buy relatively inexpensively, Micro Center or Fry's. Those are great for uh, running A or multiple pies. So they may be a good piece to look on. And they're frequently on sale and relatively expensive. Yes, Mark? Which store has the biggest assortment? Which store has the biggest assortment of pies? Micro Center is the, uh, is the partner for Raspberry Pi. So that would be the place you want to go. Uh, fries, you can get access, you know, PC accessories and small cables and that kind of thing. But if you actually want a pie, just drive your car to Micro Center. A couple other things on the on the pie here, display port. So uh, uh, the Raspberry Pi Foundation makes a seven inch touch screen. Uh, that's where this interface is with it. Um, all the storage on uh, these pies is solid state. So they take the little micro USB cards that go in like they go in your phone or new cameras. They're relatively inexpensive to get. Uh, I usually buy, what I try and do is if I'm gonna make multiple projects, I make one image, so I start with a base version of the Pi software, and I make that the same size. So I buy the same size uh, cards from the same company, because you can buy 8 gig cards that are Micro Center brand, and 8 gig cards that are SanDisk brand, but guess what? They're not both exactly the same size, and you'll for sure have the small one that you're trying to write to as you're trying to start a new project. So uh, make it easy on yourself, uh, a top tip is buy a bunch of the same size cards at one time uh, and you can't go wrong there. Finally, here's the, the magic part of the Pi is the 40-pin uh, GPIO. This is where you interface your uh, touch sensors or your GPSs, motors for running uh, robots, whatever you want to do. This is the kind of the magic place where you can plug sensors directly in and read them directly. Uh, and there's all kinds of different GPIO ports. So let me flip over to, I think, the next slide. Look at this. Uh, you can power something from the Pi. You can use something called I2C, which is a more logic-based or SPI. Or you can just use generally sensed pins. So if I want to set up a pin and say, like, GPIO 25, I want to say, if it's high, turn on a relay. If it's low, turn off a relay. You can just set uh, a simple on-off uh, setup like that. Uh, the Pi B and B plus and, and uh, C actually give uh, model three give you 40 pins. If you get into the early Pi's, if you have it along a, a Pi A, uh, that only has actually 26 pins. So that's why you see the, the difference here. But found a lot of demand for pins, so that's one of the things that they uh, they set up along the way. So why am I up here talking about Pi's? Why am I the Pi guy? Well, small. I like them. I just spend a lot of time with them. It's like, why are you a ham radio guy or a DX guy? You didn't go to school for DX. You just decided, hey, I like to do DX, so I'm going to do more of it. I'm going to read up about it and do those kind of things. So um, my projects are really, I can't say that any single project I've done is an original project. It's always been based on or built on something somebody else has done along the way. But what I like to do is say, well, if I'm going to make a, a GPS clock, how can I make it my own and personalize it? So one of the things I did was I made a, and I can show you after, I made a GPS clock, but I put a display on it. So it has its own display and it continually counts in. Uh, and it can work off of a battery so I can take it in the field with me if I need to know what time it is. So th those are the kinds of things I, I like to do uh, or combine multiple projects together into one item. Um, a lot of what goes on in the Raspberry Pi is Linux-based. 
I am a very basic Linux person. I don't know a lot about <laughs> Linux, but what I do know is it's a lot like DOS when I was doing DOS back in the day. Uh, and again, a lot of us gray hairs probably have spent more time than we like on DOS. So if you can get over the fact that instead of typing DIR, you type LS, there you go. You're 80% you're of the way there already. <laughs> Uh, po projects I've done, I've done, and you'll see some pictures later on, I've got a couple of dashboards, so basically taking a little pie, plug it into a big monitor, and now I've got this dynamically uh, updating display, temperatures, sensors, APRS, uh, telling me what port my little, uh, my little six pack is on. Eventually I will have that programmed in there, so it actually dynamically updates, but that's the idea. I mentioned a couple of clocks. I built a, a shack automation relay panel, so uh, this is pretty cool. I can actually dial in uh, over a VPN to my house and turn on my radios if I want to listen or monitor to them. Or even if I'm upstairs, I want to get the radios warmed up before I go downstairs, I just go on, bing, bang, boom, lights come on, radios come on, I'm ready to go as soon as I walk in the shack. APRS receiver and iGate. I, uh, uh, I can listen to uh, 144.390 and send that data into, uh, into the network. Uh, I just have a little antenna on it. My antenna really covers kind of the window of between 400 and 85 on 285. I, I, that's mostly where I see traffic from, but it covers, and it's, uh, it's kind of a fill-in receiver, so that's pretty cool. Uh, I'll talk about DVAPs a little bit and ADSB uh, in the project stuff. Um, something that we all hate is ads on the internet, even though they do pay for a lot of stuff. Um, uh, they make it uh, pretty simple to implement ad blocking DNS. So you download the software and then you tell your computer, hey, I want you to look up internet addresses against my Raspberry Pi versus the normal internet one and it'll block ads along the way. Uh, some home security cameras, just pretty simply using what is uh, out there to uh, do motion detection. There's some standard motion detection software for the pod. Get that on there and then have that feed into a, a home server. And then finally, uh, my wife said she wanted one of those little Nintendo things for Christmas and darned if I could find one. But what I was able to find is the software to build a retro pie. So you take a, a pie, you load it with uh, all the original games, you buy a um, a controller at Micro Center, and now for about 80 bucks, you've got a, you know, a game console that takes you everywhere from Atari 2600 all the way up to, uh, through Intellivision and uh, some of the uh, old uh, gaming consoles uh, up into the probably into the into the 90s. That thing is powerful enough to run some of those games. So uh, over here on the left is my stack of pies. Uh, this is on a wall in my shack. I've got the clock. Whoa. <laughs> Nobody here who knows. Whee. I got the clock. I've got an ADSB and ten. Uh, excuse me. I've got APRS, ADSB, uh, a GPF or um, excuse me, a DVAP, and that's my uh, DNS ad server. So they all just kind of sit there and plug into my network and uh, plug away. All of that uh, runs off one power supply. Here's the uh, relay I was mentioning, so it's all 12 volt, runs through the, uh, uh, one side comes through this uh, rig runner power supply, so I've got all the, uh, all the circuit breakers, uh, and then this will tell me kind of how everything's running, and I can run, again, my flex, uh, my computer, my lights, uh, all that kind of thing can be turned on remotely because uh, it's all power poles. This was a fun and different project I did. So with this, I went on a cruise uh, last year and I took a Raspberry Pi and I made it into a time-lapse camera that posted to Twitter. So every four hours, whenever it had an internet connection, it just posted to where are Jim and Tammy on Twitter. Uh, and so all our friends could go, oh look, here's Jim and Tammy. They're at 35 degrees north by 182 degrees west. So, not 182, but 120 <laughs> degrees west. So they're, uh, you know, they're closing into uh, uh, into Alaska, so um, that was a lot of fun to build and uh, integrate with Twitter. So lots of different ideas of things you could do with a Pi here. There's other small form, small platform computing platforms, and I didn't want to not touch on them because I think 
there are different platforms for different projects and for different things you might want to do. Um, Arduinos and EgoBones, uh, they are, in my mind, more for just plain automation than for computing power. So somebody told me once, it's a rule of thumb to use two ANDs. So if you want to download uh, data from the GPS network, and have it as a clock, and have it on your network as a network time server, then you're talking about a Pi. So if you can do two ANDs, you kind of want the additional processing power that a Pi gives. If you just want a GPS signal, or if you just want uh, the ability to interface a camera or a sensor, you're more likely to be fitting into the BeagleBone or uh, Arduino, because the price is lower as well. I think with the Zero W, maybe that's a little bit different now, but uh, when you're comparing $35 board versus a $10 board for some things, uh, you'll make that decision kind of based on your project. Well, uh, Make sense? Wouldn't the Pi be easier to program? It depends on what you want to program it for. Arduinos take really more simple, basic types of, of linear... I, I think of it like... I said basic, but I really do think of it like... Machine it's language. A, it's, a, it's a scripting... Uh, program versus more, a more detailed logic-based C kind of program in my mind. And I'm probably doing the Arduino uh, a little short trip because I haven't used it as much, but that's that's kind of my takeaway of it. Norm, did you have a question? Well, the, because I've always thought of the Arduino and the legal bone as controllers for, I think, the Raspberry Pi is a small computer. But I think it's a fair way to say it. Controllers so versus computers. What's the difference in those two? The, the BeagleBone and the Arduino, are they about the same? They're about the same. The BeagleBone is uh, a little bit more powerful from a computing perspective, where Arduino is really down to kind of, here's the basic controller logic circuit, uh, and you can plug stuff into it. The BeagleBone will run Linux, the Arduino yeah. won't run Linux. BeagleBone will run Linux, uh, and Arduino won't, which makes sense. There's also other platforms. These, there's the Intel Edison platform uh, that also is out there that I didn't mention. And uh, there's another, There's every every few months there's a Kickstarter. You, is that Orion or Onion, or what was that one we just got? Onion. Onion, so, so there's another one out there as well. That's even smaller, so their, their thing is, we're the smallest uh, controller you can get, or smallest computer you can get. So poke around, there's probably something for each project you might want to do. Yes, sir? When you get these the case uh, is, uh, is extra. Usually they're around 4 or $5. Uh, uh, you can buy the cases. A lot of people make the cases. You can get them on on, uh, I usually buy mine on Amazon, uh, but you can get them over at, uh, at Micro Center for a couple of bucks. Uh, some folks like to get the bottom of the cases, but not the top, and they actually sell them separately because you may want to interface stuff into the top uh, and just need some mounting. So, uh, and then a lot of people like to 3D print their cases, so that's kind of a tie back to, to some things we do. Yeah, Nick. There's also a Lego kit for a case. There's a Lego kit for a case, and actually, I don't know if you can see it, but this is a Lego kit case. So the camera, you can't see on the other side, but the camera is actually attached uh, Lego style. All right, so we talked about what the Pi is. It's an ARM processor. The most popular boards are the C and the Zero. Uh, it runs Linux. Um, you can't run standard Windows on it. But I will say there is a Windows version called the Windows Internet of Things version that you could run on a Pi. It's not a graphic user interface, so, you know, what good is Windows without actual Windows? But you, so basically it's MS-DOS. Uh, but you can uh, put that on there. If, if that's your flavor of, of computer, then uh, that comes on there as well. Can you run DOS? Um, <coughs> I've seen just about anything run on a Pi. In fact, I just saw somebody do a Pi with a zero W and a small display running Windows 95. So I think if you can run Windows 95, you could probably run DOS as well. <coughs> One of the things that, yes sir? You can, you can run open source Office. You can run open source? Office. 
office. Yes, uh, there's a... Uh, yes, so, so I didn't talk about this uh, much in my presentation, but if you wanted to use a Pi as maybe a second chat computer, it makes a pretty decent computer, right? If you're comfortable running Linux, they have a desktop called Pixel now uh, that has open office. It has, uh, you can easily download, um, if you like to do PSK31, it's uh, FL Digi runs on there, and I've run a Pi with FL Digi just to be, connect to a radio and gather via um, uh, feed into the uh, Pioware, not the Pioware, the um, PSK reporter site, you can run it that way, so uh, there's, it would make a nice second computer in your shack. It would make a nice computer if you got a 9, 10, 11 year old who you want to kind of make experiment a little bit. You find an old monitor in the shed, you give them this computer and, and keyboard and mouse and let, let them go at it because they're going to break something that's you know worth the cost that you're going to spend probably to take them to lunch that day and buy them a couple of Happy Meals. So uh, it's uh, it's definitely something you don't worry about breaking along the way. I talked a little bit about Linux. Uh, I do want to say you really don't need to be intimidated by Linux in this version. There are window you know Windows type of software, so desktop software. It looks like Windows. It has a a button that says start that you click on and you can find your program. So uh, there are Windows-like uh, features of this. So if you're getting held up by the fact that, well, it's a Pi, it runs Linux, I don't know Linux, I don't want to run it, don't let that hold you up. Dive in and experiment a little bit. Um, for some of the free stuff that comes on a Pi, again, because this is set up for kids, the entire Wolfram Mathematica software suite comes on there very easy to uh, to use that in uh, a lot of science applications. Uh, there's lots of programming environments, Python, uh, Mathematica is there, um, and it's easy to get too, so it's free, it's a free download, so as long as you've got broadband, you can suck that sucker down and away you go. If not, you can buy a card with it on there for five, six, eight bucks extra uh, on top of the cost of the uh, Raspberry Pi card. So I'm going to talk about two projects that you can get started with. Uh, and I think these projects make good starter projects because they're not overly complex in either hardware or software. So I like the GPS clock. It's fun to build, but it requires soldering and identifying pins and a lot of other things. These two are a little bit more plug-and-play projects. Uh, so uh, I think they're both relatively easy to get started with from that perspective. The first one will be ADSB, and I think it's perfect that we're in this EAA hangar tonight because it really is about hearing. Uh, ADSB is uh, signals that airplanes send out. So uh, most, almost all commercial planes and a lot of private planes have an ADSB uh, transponder. They send out a signal on 1090 megahertz, and you just go in and uh, you can receive that signal and. Uh, see where they are, and, and I'll show you what that display looks like. So it's a really easy project to do uh, by adding a, uh, a sound card, and uh, I'll show you uh, what that looks like. The other project is uh, is a DVAP that has a Raspberry Pi attached. So I think uh, most folks who are familiar with DSTAR know what a DVAP is. Uh, a local ham uh, helped come up with this, and this is a 10 milliwatt uh, DSTAR repeater in a little box right here. Uh, so you can go on and uh, connect this up to a uh, to a wireless connection or a wire connection uh, to an internet connection, and away you go. You're on the D-Star network. You're talking on reflectors, and you're making good contacts there. So uh, we'll talk about both of these projects here uh, and take you through it a little bit. Uh, a couple of things that I want to make sure that everybody aware is this is not going to be the plug A into B and everything works kind of uh, project. I'm going to give you the overview of the project. This is not complete instructions, okay? Um, the other thing is, I wrote this presentation a month ago, stuff has already changed, right? So there's the Pi W that's come out, and people are making enhancements to their software and those kind of things. So what works today may not work tomorrow, and you may need to figure it out. And, you know, you're all hands, right? You've figured stuff out along the way. You've troubleshot a connection, or you've figured out why you're, uh, you're not getting power to your... Uh, to your receiver, so that's uh, something you need to think about. Uh, I'd also say check the Pi you want to use the project on before you do it. Some projects do require a little more horsepower, 
and you may want to make sure you've got that pi 3 versus the 0 and have the additional power. Um, I mentioned this kind of a little bit off and on, but it's $35 or it's $10, right? Don't be afraid to break it because it's like breaking a bow fang. And <laughs> you know, are, are a lot of us worried about breaking a bow fang? I, I don't think we are. So don't be afraid to break it. Get in there and, and tear it up. And, and, you know, if you screw up the software, it takes you 10 minutes to rewrite that software and start again from scratch. So breaking it is half the fun, I think. <laughs> Um, so let's do the airplane tracker here first. So we are building a receiver to download, interpret, and map airplane traffic. Uh, they send out a signal saying, here's where I am in the XYZ coordinate. So not just, uh, not just longitude and latitude, but altitude as well. Um, it's not required for all aircraft, but you're going to see it in most commercials. So if you set up out here and said, wow, I just saw a plane land and I didn't get my ADSB, yeah, you know, some of these small Cessnas and those kind of things may not have that on there yet. Uh, but what I recommend is a Raspberry Pi Model B, a, uh, a Pi 3 Model B, a 8 gig micro SD card, a 2 amp power supply, and an RTL TV tuner dongle. And what that is, is back when they started the digital transition, and you remember that they turned off analog TV, well, they started making these little USB sticks that would allow you to decrypt digital television, you can plug it into your computer and watch TV. Somebody figured out that, hey, I can make a little easy change here and there, and now instead of watching TV, I have a software receiver that will actually go from about 25 megahertz to about 1.2 gigahertz. So anything I want to listen to in that band, I got a receiver. Isn't this awesome? So software-defined radio really jumped out uh, with a really simple Pi project. So folks have written this, and really a little industry has come about by using these TV tuners to uh, decode aviation stuff and put it out on the internet. So uh, we will, uh, it's fun, but there's also other fun things you could do with that as well. Uh, so five steps to get to really make this project work. First thing you're going to do is a company called FlightAware.com makes a special version of the Pi software called PiAware. All you need to do is about a two gig download. You go to you go to flightaware.com slash PiAware, say I want this file, you get the zip, down it comes, you unzip it, everybody's unzipped it before, you're all set to go, you got this on your Windows or your Mac computer. You then take that image and and when you unzip it it'll be a dot ing file and you burn that, write it, whatever, to the micro SD card. How many people here have burned a CD before? or a DVD. It's the same process. You go in and you say, I want this to be written onto that, and it does it and you're done. So it's really not any harder than burning an image to a CD. You want to build your own antenna in this project. So uh, it'll come with a little stubby antenna, it'll look about this high, and say, you'll say, hey, that's pretty cool, but I think as we know as hams particularly, a crappy little antenna is a crappy little antenna. Uh, so if you make yourself a better antenna, you've really got the opportunity to get some better signals and uh, some better reception out of that. Uh, and then, let's see, plug antenna into receiver, plug receiver into Pi, plug card into Pi, put power on, and you're all set to go. You actually, that flight aware image uh, will then tell you to go to their site, and it'll say, hey, I just saw a Raspberry Pi send me a signal from this same IP address. Are you then, do you want to claim your Pi? And you'll say yes, and now you're tracking and sending airplane signals uh, into the internet and helping people understand when flight 227 from Dallas is going to make it into Hartsfield uh, because they'll see it fly over your house. Uh, so downloading the image file, as I just mentioned, you all have done this before by burning disks. Uh, it's the same thing. The only thing uh, you're going to change is you're going to use uh, two different pieces of software. First one is SD Formatter, just what it sounds like. You plug your little SD card in, it just makes sure it's wiped clean so you can fully uh, load that up. Uh, and then you're going to download a program called Win32 Disk Imager. That's the program instead of your uh, software burger program, that's the program that writes it to your SD card. If you're using a Mac, Guess what? Mac already has built-in image tools. You just open that crud up and you go to your disk files 
and away you go. So you've got both options ready to go there on your pile. Question? Yeah. So the image, the image is the operating system with the software already configured and loaded. Correct. Yep, it's everything configured and loaded and ready to go. Uh, you just plop it on your Pi and uh, you're playing away. It's like, uh, like I think of it like it's like downloading a ROM for a game or downloading a CD for a game. It's the same kind of thing. It's, it's, it's like, all an I, like an ISO file. Like an, it, it, it is exactly an ISO file. So you're all set there. Uh, micro SD cards, I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Buy a bunch at the same time. I love this little holder. I've got this holder at home, so I just wanted to give them a plug too. But buy one at the same time. Stick with the same size uh, and keep some organization so you can actually find your cards again because I ended up with 20 cards in a drawer and could never find the exact one I wanted. So, again, this thing was a little bit of a lifesaver. Come on, we've all thrown stuff in a drawer, right? And just to try to find it later? Yeah, absolutely. All right, so uh, another tip. What I like to do is, and it's not uh, necessarily uh, as needed for this Pioware project, but in general what I like to do is I'll download the latest version of, right now the version is called Raspbian and Jesse, uh, the latest version of the Raspberry Pi software from the, from the group, and I will do my own customization. I like to set up my wireless network, I like to have it available so I can uh, access it through my Windows network as a shared drive. So I will do all that kind of stuff, and then I will stop and save that. Then I have, then when I want to build a GPS, or I want to build a, a new flight aware, or I want to have an ad, uh, ad sharing pie, I've got the same basic setup to start with, so I don't have to spend the next 45 minutes figuring out all that stuff first. I've got something ready to go. Uh, you know, it takes up 8 gigs of storage if you're using 8 gig cards, so it's not really uh, really too hard, and uh, it's just as easy, I'll use the DVD or CD term, it's just as easy to rip an image off a uh, existing SD card as it is to write one on there. So, uh, it's a, a pretty good tip to get going there. When you uh, build this project, and I hope you will, uh, you want to get a RTL SDR dongle. That's the brand or the, the typical trade name you'll see of the dongle. Uh, these were originally made to be TV tuners, as I mentioned, uh, but uh, as you can see, kind of FlightAware is branding their own. If you want this branded one, $17 on Amazon. If you want the generic one, 5 to $20 for something like this or, or something basically like this. They're both basically the same thing. All they've done is added a little preamp into theirs to make it work a little bit better and focused on that. But Think about this, right? RTL SDR. This can receive from two point, uh, from what I say, 25 megahertz to 1.2 gigahertz. You can make a receiver that listens to your repeater and streams it over the internet. You could make a receiver that listens just to uh, APRS and puts APRS into the uh, internet. You can make a receiver that scans uh, police channels if that's what you like to do. You can decode. Um, uh, I know people who decode pager traffic. Yes, there is still pager traffic out there, and yes, you can decode it. So there's all kinds of different things you can do. What, what, what do you ever want to listen to on RF? Uh, you can do that now with Raspberry Pis. You can just plug it in in uh, 25 megahertz, right? So you can uh, you can set it up to 10 meters. You can do a PSK skimmer or a uh, or a CW skimmer for 10 meters, no additional hardware required. Antenna build, I think this is the fun part as a ham for, for doing this project because it's really easy to just kind of make a little, grab a connector and make a little antenna. So um, I did this, uh, this is a similar one to what I did, so it's a, a 259 style connector, uh, or I guess SO239 to be specific, uh, that folks just kind of took and hey, here's a piece of uh, measured uh, coat hanger and a couple of extra pieces screwed on there and away you go. This is more of a dipole version of that. Uh, and then this is the commercial one too. So if you want to have a really perfectly tuned antenna to receive your uh, flight aware because you want to be one of the top 500 in the country and you want to have this thing all the way up in the top of your highest tree and hear everybody coming into Hartsfield new, you can do that. And if you want to see how Nuke does it, you go ask Nuke because he's got that, that set up and it's kind of fun. 
All right, um, so connecting it all up, you plug the RTL dongle in, you plug in some Wi-Fi or Ethernet. Uh, actually, you want to start with Ethernet and then connect up your Wi-Fi afterwards because remember you downloaded this image, it didn't have your Wi-Fi settings in there, so you need to go in and do that afterwards. Uh, power on and wait a few minutes, um, your battery's running out on cyber, uh, mm -hmm. uh, cyber. <laughs> your cyber uh, boss there. Um, power it on and wait a few minutes uh, because it needs to start up the, for the first time. It takes three or four minutes for the Pyware stuff to get going and falling home. So turn it on, let it go get a cup of coffee, let it, you know, let it do its thing for a minute, and then go to flightaware.com and claim it. Uh, you'll be much more likely to find it if you give it five minutes. Um, if you want to just sit at home and have it offline, you don't have to do that. You can find your Pi's IP address on your home network. I'm not going to explain how to do that. You can figure that out later. Uh, and then just go to your page, like if you've got a, your home network is 192.168.1. whatever your Pi is. If you go to put a call in port 8080, it actually has its own web server. You can watch just the stuff off your Pi coming in uh, without sharing it out. You can also telnet into it uh, or hey, why don't we try plugging in a keyboard and mouse and seeing if that works. That'll work too. Uh, so that's another way you can do it as well. So a couple of different ways to access your Pi, but headless works fine. So uh, you just plug it in and you go to the web page, you can see what you're looking at. Here's what success looks like. So this is uh, this little black dot is where my house is, and these are the planes that I'm seeing around. Uh, this is the FlightAware software as I see it <clears throat> looking at that web page at home. It's telling me flight numbers. It's telling me what they're squawking, so uh, what number they're using in the air traffic control system, altitude, speed, how far they are away from me, uh, what track they're running. So this one's running uh, uh, 350 degrees north. Uh, and then uh, how many messages I've received from it. So I've gotten 2,900 messages, and all my messages are current because my age is zero. Uh, and it'll actually keep track. You can see here's that plane. It's actually kind of going off over Smyrna right now uh, and tracking stuff. But Delta 14 is uh, coming in and uh, it's headed, uh, uh, let's see, 142. So this is probably one of these guys headed down to Hartsfield. But it's kind of fun on a busy day at Hartsfield to watch these suckers just line up. It really is interesting to be able to see. And you can see it from pretty far away. What I see is actually... Uh, I can get about 100 miles of a flight that's really at, at altitude, 30,000, 40,000 feet. I can see them over Chattanooga or uh, even further away. Lower to the ground, I'm actually a bit more restricted. And I live fairly close to the Cat Beach Street Airport, um, which kind of got me interested in what's flying over my house kind of thing. Uh, and I found that um, because of the terrain, I'm actually sit below, of like about 100 feet below DeKalb Peach Tree Airport, so I can only see them to about 1,000 feet before they land, uh, and, then, uh, and then I lose them because I'm below the terrain. But it's fun to watch, and maybe someday I'll talk somebody into uh, let me put one at the airport, and uh, we can track things a little bit closer. A couple other tips. I mentioned backup, backup, backup. Uh, the micro SD cards in particular don't like a lot of read and writes, so if you buy the better ones, they last a little bit longer. Uh, but if you have an unintentional power blip, you could wipe that out. So when you get a good image or a good setup just the way you want it, take the extra minute, rip the, the uh, version of that onto a backup somewhere onto your computer so you don't have to rebuild the whole thing from scratch uh, if it breaks. Even though that's what I like to do half the time because it's just more fun. Um, every Pi comes with a default password, so if you download that, that software, uh, the username is Pi, and I know your, your password is Raspberry, so let's all be smart, let's change our passwords because we don't want some strange hack to come out into the wild and then people are turning, like people were turning webcams into zombies across the internet. You don't want that for your Pi, so just change your password and you won't have to worry about it. Uh, so Piware, uh, quick tips here. Uh, height matters if you want good reception, so if you can get that sucker up. Uh, I mentioned Newt and I both have a very similar setup, but his is uh, about 100 feet higher in the air, and you can get, what, 250, 300 miles of uh, reception on yours, Newt? Yes. Yeah, so uh, height does make a difference on this one. Um, you can go in and clean up some things. In, inside the Raspberry Pi, uh, it has a basic setup software called Raspy Config. 
uh, and uh, you're going to type sudo, super user do, <laughs> and then run raspberry config, and it will allow you to do some customized local settings, uh, set time, set keyboards, those kind of things. Uh, so you can expand the file system and do some other things, so that's a tip. Uh, as well as, particularly with these flight awares, there's something called, uh, oh, I just, the name of it just <laughs> spaced out on me, but there's a way that you can share data between Pi awares, but what you need to do is make sure that your Pi is very accurate on time and very accurate on location. So you want your GPS in there to four or five decimal points if you can, because that allows the pies to triangulate and it will allow you to see more data than just your pie gets because they triangulate between uh, various receptions that they get. So uh, a good, and that's called MLAT. So if you want to see a lot of MLAT, you want to see extra planes on there, uh, make sure your pie is set up with a really good altitude and GPS coordinates. So any questions on the uh, PiAware project before I get into the uh, DVAP a little bit? Yes, sir. <clears throat> so for uh, APRS iGate uh, receive only, yep. similar setup. APRS iGate receive only, similar setup. You want to do a <laughs> two meter antenna. You want to uh, get the uh, PiAware, the FlightAware software. Now you're going to go in and do some different things. What I recommend is a program called Direwolf, D-I-R-E-W-O-L-F. This uh, guy has specifically designed instructions for Pi that you can follow step by step, uh, and you download it. I think it's a GitHub project. You, uh, he'll tell you how to, you know, once you get your basic image downloaded, he'll tell you how to set it all up, what settings you need to do. I didn't include it on here because it's a little more complex because you've got to go in and do some more configuration settings, but similar hardware setup with the right software, you can easily be hearing uh, hearing APRS stuff in about an hour. Thank you. Sure. All right. Um, everybody needs help, right? And and like I said earlier, I'm not a Linux guy. I still think I still want to type DIR half the time to see what files are in there. Um, I go to adafruit.com. They have a learn section that's really good. Uh, in fact, they have kind of the 15 different projects you need to know uh, to get your Pi going. And for me, I always, I like to do the Wi-Fi settings via, um, via command line. I'm, I'm, I don't use the graphical interface as much. And I always forget the exact directory folder, or it's WPA supplicant dot blah, 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 blah. I can never remember. I don't keep that information in my brain anymore. But I know that I can go to Adafruit and find that exact page, because I have a bookmark, uh, and I just write it down and, and it's all there. So you want to figure out how to set up your Wi-Fi. How do you download that card for the first time? How do you get your um, get a, a small device interface with this, like a thermometer or something? Uh, you can do all that in Adafruit's got. It, you can start there and span the world on different projects that they put together. And if you want to get going on there, the other benefit of Adafruit is they sell the hardware as well. So uh, you can go and buy uh, thermometers and GPS chips and those kind of things uh, and their instructions interface with their hardware so if you don't want to figure it out you push an easy button on that and uh, it works fairly often. DVAP a la pie. Uh, a lot of folks have done a lot of things with DVAPs uh, so you've probably seen this project before but part of the reason why you have is it's really easy. So we'll go through it real quick here. Uh, a DVAP, as I mentioned, it's a DV access point. It is a small D-star repeater, for lack of a better term. Uh, when it's connected to your home network, it allows you to do things like uh, connect to uh, other repeaters, connect to uh, the reflectors on D-star. I don't need to sell you on D-star. I bet you John has already done a pretty good job of doing that over time. Um, uh, this is an officially supported version of software. So Robin Cutshaw, AA4RC, who uh, has created the lovely DVAP and the DV dongle and some other software, he coded the software for Linux and for the Pi. It is officially supported, so you can go and get uh, this software. And you don't find a lot of officially supported Linux software. So that's kind of a, a cool thing here. So again, I recommend a Model B right now, although I will say 
my newest project, and I'm kind of taking this on the road with me this week, is I'm going to see if I can get this working on a W. I think I can. So uh, we'll see how that goes. 8 gig micro SD card again. I kind of use 8 gig as the base just because it's a it's a, a decent size and a decent price. So you can get one for seven or eight dollars, uh, and they're readily available. Uh, and you're not trying to juggle and remove things to just fit the basic in. You need a DVAP. This is two hundred dollars somewhere in that right neck of the woods. Um, sometimes you find them used online. Uh, you know, shop the shop the other places. But support Robin. By name. Uh, and then uh, you need a broadband internet connection of some kind, even your phone. A lot of guys have done this on their phone, and I think with the W, I think you're going to see even more of that. Uh, people are using either Wi Fi, uh, jetpacks, those kind of things to use D Star on the road. So, five steps you're going to download the basic Raspbian and Jesse file uh, and burn it to the Pi. You're going to connect the DVAP, you're going to connect it to network and power. Uh, a little bit different here is that the DVAP software is primarily a graphical software. You can run it in command line mode, but it's primarily a graphical software. So we'll talk about uh, running headless graphically, uh, download that software, and then fire it up and make some cues notes. <clears throat> so I've got about five more minutes here. I will uh, kind of buzz through on this. Raspy and Jesse is the supported software from uh, the Raspberry Pi Foundation. So this is their official OS, uh, and if you need more information on that, you can. You download the image file, you rip it to your card, you go in, and the first two things you do are update it, uh, run Raspi config to set your local settings, your Wi-Fi country, those kind of things, uh, and then you run uh, sudo apt-get update. And what that does is it makes sure you pull down the latest drivers and the latest software. Uh, you get your local customization going. Like I said, I like to do my own wireless and make sure it uses my time server and those kind of things. And then, that's where I save it. That's my base image to do whatever I want to do the next time. Actually, uh, you'll see these images here. Raspi and Jesse, uh, the latest version, this version says 2016 from November. They actually just released a version uh, in February to support the Pi W. Uh, so if you, uh, if you get started on one, make sure now you're using that image uh, because this image will not run the Pi W, I found out to my detriment Sunday night. Because I was going to have this thing ready to go. This was going to be cool. I was going to demonstrate it and put on the Pi W. Look, I got D-Star going ahead. Didn't work out this time. Um, but generally, this couldn't be more plug and play, right? All DVAP has is a USB <coughs> plug here, and it plugs into another USB. It uses uh, it uses the power of the computer it's on. Uh, to power itself. So, uh, again, using two amp power supply will be really important. Otherwise, you'll starve your Pi, you'll crash it, you'll wonder, why is my Pi crashing? Because it doesn't have enough power to do what it needs to do. Just remember that. Why is my Pi crashing? First thing you want to look at. Did I, Jim told me, do I have enough power on my Pi? Well, if you don't, there you go. Uh, so once we get this going, we've, we've, put the, we've ripped the software out of the card, we fired up the Pi, we've decided that we want to uh, run it headless. Uh, what we're going to do is run a program called VNC, Virtual Network Computing. A little bit different than the program a lot of you may use to stream media, VLC. VNC is really set up to just be a freeware desktop sharing software. And they've actually built VNC into the Raspberry Pi configuration. So when you go into Raspberry Config, you can say, yes, please turn on VNC for me. And that's all you need to do. You can set up a special password or not for it, and you're all set to go. Uh, you download a client. It's free. All you do is put in the IP address of your Pi. Guess what? You're looking at your Pi desktop. You never need to have a monitor for that Pi. Uh, on the Pi, you'll run a few commands to get VNC going. Again, I'm going to tell you, if you have any questions on how to use it, go to Adafruit. They'll explain it to you. Uh, it's pretty easy. Free desktop client uh, for Windows or Mac. I'm sure it's out there for Linux too. I just never get it because I read stuff off of Linux virtually. I don't use it as a desktop. Yes. Um, so if you uh, you know put your SD card into the Pi, if you don't have it hooked up to a monitor or stuff, is there any way to discover what its IP address is without looking on your router and looking for a MAC address? I I look on my router. Okay. Um, one of the things I've done when I did an earlier project was I actually had it, the Pi set up 
It's a little more complicated, but I had the Pi set up to be its own mail server. So when it came on, I ran a command and said, send an email as soon as you fire up and tell me what your IP address is. It's another way to do it. Um, I just static, you know, once I get it going, I statically assign it in my router and then it's always there. So it, your mileage may vary. Uh, downloading the DBAP software for the Pi, the latest version is 1.05. Uh, they just updated it recently. Uh, you can download it from dbapdongle.com uh, and again that is the supported version. If you want to try a version that is uh, not supported yet, it's in beta. OpenDStar.org slash tools, that's where Robin posts his uh, practice stuff. And we actually sat with him uh, one Sunday while we did an install and he said, oh I want to change this or I want to do that or I see how you're doing this. Let me, let me look at it differently. So he is very interactive on this software and uh, we can get him to help out. But uh, So the basic overview on what you want to do is install your dependencies on the Pi. You're going to uh, download this uh, piece to the Pi desktop, execute. Uh, there's some options where you can add a desktop icon or not. Uh, once you fire that up, you pick a frequency. Let's see, I think I have a screenshot on the next page. Yep, you fire this up, you say what frequency do you want this on? You can, if you've got a 2 meter Pi, you pick a 2 meter one. You've got a 440 Pi, what do you pick? The, yeah, you, know, you pick a 440. Um, and then you push, where it says close here, you push start. And it starts. And if you don't do anything else, it just sits there and listens for you to talk to it. Uh, and you can do some fun stuff too. So one of the things that Robin taught us is, uh, you see this record button on here. Uh, every time you can either go in via RF or every time you go in and do, there's a Pi command that you, that's called echo. And every time you do an echo command, it goes in and it writes a small audio file to your hard drive so it can play it back uh, when it echoes it back. Well, you can actually rename that file to the default files in the software. So instead of saying, uh, my Pi, instead of saying remote system linked, because everybody's heard that if they have a DVAP or a, a D-Star, right? Instead of saying remote system linked in, Robert's, in Robin's voice, which kind of sounds like remote system linked, you can actually change it to yourself and say, hey, you linked up, way to go, buddy, or whatever you want, right? Uh, so uh, like mine, so when it says info, mine says, this is the N4 BFR repeater DVAP. And I just think that's the coolest thing in the world just because I got to do it myself. So just a fun little extra thing you can do with your DVAP. Uh, some hits you can, uh, hints you can take at mobile. Uh, I think a lot of you guys know K4FH. He was the first one I saw to do this. Uh, he basically got uh, like a small uh, waterproof box. He put a MiFi in there. He put a bigger battery uh, and he put a Pi with the DVAP in there and he takes that thing anywhere. Uh, and he's always got D-Star in his car as he's driving down 75 or going to South Carolina or whatever. So uh, you can buy one of these, and there's people who make it for hundreds of dollars. Or you can build one yourself for about the same price and have a lot more fun to know how it works and do those kind of things. Uh, one thing I will remind you that you don't want to put 50 watts out of your home antenna into your DVAP uh, because it's only a 10 milliwatt uh, radio. So just be careful there when you're doing that. For me, my some of my in-home Wi-Fi is marginal because I have a lot of neighbors with Wi-Fi. So I find that connecting it by Ethernet keeps me from doing a lot of RGB2 on the DVAP. Your mileage may vary. As I said, I'm going to try it with a, a W, but uh, something to think about is this may be a project that you want to hardwire, especially if it's going to be a more permanent install, uh, just to get the quality up a little bit. Questions on the DVAP project? All right, cool. Ask John if you have any questions. No, I'm <laughs> a couple of tips. Uh, as you get into Linux, this is one thing that will drive you crazy. Um, where Windows is not case sensitive, if you, type, uh, if you type something, it's the same whether it's uppercase, lowercase, or mixed. Linux is not like that. If you type ls and the s is capital, it won't recognize that. It thinks it's a different command than ls lowercase. So uh, if you're new to Linux, that is something that may trip you up the first time. Uh, and then I just kind of mentioned this build versus buy. Yeah, you can buy something that has this all this DVAP stuff integrated, but if you can build it yourself, isn't that a little more fun than 
uh, don't you learn a little bit more by doing it? So uh, I like learning something new and building it if I can, for the most part. So if you're inspired, let me tell you a couple of things as I wrap up about a couple other projects you can make. Uh, I will show you up here if you want to make your own uh, GPS time server. Why would you want to do that? Because you can have super accurate time on your home network. Um, it comes right off the uh, GPS satellite, so that's about as accurate time as you can get at home. It does require some soldering and that kind of thing, but uh, it's a great uh, network appliance. And uh, especially if you're into things like Whisper, which are more time sensitive, you can use it. I'm not going to tell you that you need it for Whisper because Whisper is based on the second, not the millisecond or microsecond. But it's always nice to have, right? You can say, hey, I'm, I'm a little more accurate on Whisper. Uh, we talked about making the APRS. Direwolf, again, is the program that I recommend for that if you want to play with that. There are others out there. Uh, you can stream the repeater, 147.075. Just listen to it, spit it out. Uh, have a permanent uh, record of all the QSOs uh, that people make. I've tried this with the Atlanta Radio Club repeater, but I just may be far enough away that I'm not hearing it. So. Your mileage may vary on this one. And then uh, if you want to just take that SDR dongle and make a software-defined radio, there's a program called GQRX that actually will show Spectrum. Uh, Freak Show is another one that will uh, be more of a Spectrum analyzer view. Uh, so there's a bunch of different things you can go out and play with uh, if you want to play on the RF side. Didn't show those today because I'm just trying to get into the simpler projects, but. If you want to dive right in, those would be some fun ones to start with. Uh, here's my Pi that has a GPS. So I made the little uh, clock. I named it Telstar because I thought that was cool because it was <laughs> satellite time. Um, uh, but I've got uh, UTC and Eastern time on my little monitor. And then this is the GPS receiver. It just sits inside the window of my shack. It's nothing special. doesn't need any special coverage. I get about seven or eight satellites. Uh, at any one time just by having it right inside my window. Here's what Direwolf looks like uh, from APRS perspective. So again, you want to, it runs on the Pi desktop, so you want to uh, VNC in, but you can see it'll spit out kind of what it's seeing and what it's hearing along the way uh, and connect to the iGate servers. Now, if you really want to get advanced, you connect that to a radio, you can actually do the in and out and the ditch repeating as well. So all that is built into uh, Direwolf if you want to play with that. Um, a display kiosk, so I've got one that sits in my shack, it, it brings that time in, so I always have GPS time up where I can look at it, I can see my what my APRS has received and what my flight aware has received at any one time, plus it tells me eventually what my six pack is tuned to, eventually. The space is there for it. Uh, shack automation I showed you. Morse code decoder. Uh, if you just want to practice your Morse code and you want to know what dot it dot it uh, is, you plug a key into your Pi uh, and you can make a Morse code decoder. Norm was talking about the science fair. We've run this for a year or two now at the science fair. The kids love it. The kids love to be able to make the beeps and see what they're saying and see what the name is. So a really simple project uh, that a kid can build. Uh, so there's actual instructions for this project at raspberrypi.org. So if you get a kid that's interested in Morse code, buy them a Pi, give them a key, and point them at the website. Let them go from there. Uh, and then I mentioned uh, having a RetroPi uh, is the software. And again, this is kind of like uh, some of the other uh, uh, software where you download the image for RetroPi, and it's all set up, and then you just pick the games you want, and you pull them in. So uh, pretty easy to set up if you want to try with that. Here's my uh, dashboard, so I've got GPS time. I've also got temperature. Uh, I've got, uh, here's where my six pack's gonna show up one day. Uh, my ADSB tracker, you can kind of see the concentric circles. I got some planes over Chattanooga there, down near Macon. Uh, and then my APRS view, so I can see kind of who's, who's showing up there. So that's, uh, all that does is there's a little pie. It runs, uh, I like to do, I used to do web design a long time ago. I just made a little web page, and it just runs in perpetuity. It just sits there in my shack and keeps pulling this stuff up, uh, turned on, turned off, whatever. Uh, other more more advanced projects that people may want to try, I haven't tried some of these yet. Uh, you can use a software called OpenLEC uh, and really make a, a if you do a lot of uh, 
ripping uh, movies or download a lot of movies through torrents, that kind of thing. You want one software to control and kind of a TiVo-like software. Uh, OpenLEC is the way to go. If you like to track GPS satellites, you can make the same kind of display that'll show you all the satellites that's going over whenever you want. So uh, that's uh, that's GP Rick G Predict. Uh, you can uh, do a rotator controller. I've seen some of these folks who make just follow the AMSATs and it'll know when it's going and it just follows that satellite along. Um, you can make a repeater. Apparently, OpenRepeater.com says they can make a repeater with a beagle bone or a pie. So if you want to try having your own regular FM repeater, there you go. Uh, Whisper Pi. Uh, if you set up a Pi right, uh, Pi right. If you set up a Raspberry Pi correctly, uh, you can actually transmit FM off a pin on the Pi. It's not great. I've used it for a Fox Hunt before, uh, but these folks say they're actually getting Whisper to work on it. Probably uses a couple of additional resistors and that kind of thing, but it's something to play with. Uh, Retro High and then uh, FL Digi and logging programs will run just fine if you want to make it a basic shack computer uh, for like a, a logging, just a logging computer or a second computer in your shack for 35 bucks with a spare monitor and stuff. Uh, you can go there. It wasn't that right. long ago that I had a computer. So a couple of final tips I'll wrap up and get everybody out on time here. First of all, I will not make any of these for you for however much money you want to pay me. All right, maybe we can negotiate on the money. But I'm here to inspire you to do it yourself, not to make them myself, because I've made a lot of these. So I think struggling to figure out how, how these work actually is the fun. Get in there, do it yourself, have a good time, see what you can do. Uh, Learn.adafruit.com really is my go-to site. If I can't figure that out, it's amazing what a Google search will get you. And, and just, what is this error message? What does it mean when it says, can't find blah, 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 da, 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 da. You plug that in, and nine times out of ten, I'll find somebody who had the same problem, and by struggling through it, there's somebody's put on their blog somewhere, or on a GitHub page or something, exactly how to fix my, the error. So, Struggle through it, figure it out. You can do it. You're smart. Because uh, you've all passed at least the technician exam, so if you can pass the technician exam, I know you can Google. <laughs> um, finally, I do want to get questions, uh, and my email is n4bfr at arl.net. But I'll tell you right now, I barely keep up with my email, so if you're expecting some sort of help desk kind of experience, if you email me, learn how to Google. Uh, but I will try and answer questions if uh, if I can help. And then finally, if you do make something successfully, I would love to hear about it because I would really like to know that people found this interesting and uh, got in there and, and dove in. I know Greg's in the back, uh, and uh, Greg came to one of my classes, and now he's got the APRS, and he showed it over at the at the, uh, the Tech Fest the other day, and so that's that's really cool, and I kind of like that that we're building building on with people passing on the pie knowledge, so uh, that's exciting. So uh, hopefully you will uh, share your success stories. I hope you will. Uh, troubleshooting, by the way, if you can't find a menu item or a button that's kind of related, try one at random. If you've tried them all, Google it. Did it work? Yes. Hey, you're done. No? Well, let's try Googling it again or ask somebody for help if you've been after it for over half an hour. So I kind of like that troubleshooting tool. I think that's the way uh, folks can do it. Uh, finally, here's all of the software programs I mentioned. Uh, what I will do is I will get a PDF copy of this presentation and I'll send it to Paul uh, and uh, or someone and you guys can get it up on the web and so all the links will be there to get the, all the software I've mentioned uh, for the programs. And that's it. All in all done. Any questions? Thanks for having me out. Come to the Atlanta Ham Fest, and uh, don't forget to see Nude about uh, participating.